Good morning, friends at Martok Christian Fellowship. It's great to be with you again this morning, although with you virtually uh, in your own home or wherever you are uh, watching this talk. It's always a privilege to, to come and share God's word with so many friends. For those of you who, who don't know me, my name's Richard Coles. I used to be part of Martok Christian Fellowship with my family, Ruth, Edward, Harry, and, uh, and now our, our baby daughter, Edith, who uh, wasn't with us when we were in Martok. And uh, I was the um, old Jamie Bruce, if you like. And we now live in Somerton, uh, where I'm part of the leadership team at St. Clair's Chapel here in the town. Great friends of Martok Christian Fellowship. Um, we are as a church, and uh, it's lovely to keep those links going. Now, the, the, the subject that Chris gave to me this morning is very, very similar to a, a preach that I've done before um, at St. Clair's. In fact, Chris and I shared a few ideas about series um, some time ago before COVID-19. And, um, uh, the, uh, and it's no coincidence that the topic I've got is something that I've done at St. Clair's before. And I thought and reflected quite hard about what I want to do this morning because um, I, I, throughout the week I've been thinking about reworking that talk that I did uh, back in the September uh, 2019 at St. Clair's for your series today. And I've got to be honest, one of the things that I found very difficult over lockdown is preaching to a camera. It's not the same as having people in front of you. And as part of the process, I went back to listen on our church website to the talk that I gave um, on this very topic back in September. And I felt a bit sad because I heard a, a passion in my voice that I haven't really captured in my study here uh, at home, looking at the top of my IMAX screen. And um, the more I tried to, to do something to camera, the more disappointed I was that it just just wasn't the same. So this morning for your preach, it, I'm going to give you one from the archives. It does fit in very much with what you're doing at the moment. It's the right theme. Of course, I do talk about St. Clair's Chapel, um, where it was first preached in that context. But everything is, is appropriate to any uh, Christian particularly evangelical Christian. So what you're going to see are the slides from that talk and you're going to hear my voice and uh, you might hear the occasional heckle from someone at St. Clair's and, um, and I might come back on at the end just to, just to say goodbye. So I hope you understand uh, my reasoning for, for giving you one from the archives and uh, I hope you're blessed by this teaching on making mission a priority. We begin this morning a, a new series here at St. Clair's and I can't hide the fact that I am very excited. I am really excited to be unpacking with you over the next nine teaching series, nine teaching programs, our new mission statement. I know it's here wonderfully and sparkling and so on, but I want to assure you that we're not trying to say anything new. We're not trying to rewrite the rule book. We're just stating our priorities as a church. It's good to do that. You may have noticed our Prime Minister going around recently stating some of his priorities. That's because he's hoping an election's coming, isn't it? And that's what we do at times. We stand up and we say, this is what we're about. This is what we do. This is why as an organisation we exist. This is why as a church we're here. And so we're going to go through and look at these nine different points, point by point, and unpack them. But what does it mean? A little bit more about what does it mean? And I can't say everything that could be said about these points and it's not meant to be an exclusive list but as a church as we exist and live and breathe and welcome new members in and they say what is St. Clair's about it's an opportunity for us to say this is a summary of some of the things that are high priorities for us here at St. Clair's so St. Clair's Chapel sharing Jesus sharing life as you know and you heard uh, recently before the summer we've broken it up as a leadership team into these three different points reaching out Pre being part of it and pressing on, reaching out, being part of it and pressing on. And I'm really encouraged by Pete Herb that he is um, 
So he helped put this design together that he's clearly taken those design cues from the Trinity, those classical statements of the Trinity, which is lovely. And we're going to go through this morning and we're going to start with reaching out and we're going to look at our first point, making mission a priority, because that's where we start. There is no uh, no coincidence that that statement is at the top of this list of mission statement principles for our church, making mission a priority. That's so important for not just this church, but every church of Christ. We're going to go through and explore this morning why, perhaps just remind ourselves why it's a priority, why it's so important, why we need to be excited and passionate about mission, no matter what stage you are at in your life. But before we do a few definitions, what is mission? What is mission? It may seem like an obvious thing to ask. Um, or maybe seem like an obvious answer to you, but just so we're clear about what we're talking about, I'm going to use this definition here. There are other definitions we could use, granted, but we're going to go with this for this morning, that Christian mission is an organised effort, an intentional effort, a proactive effort to spread Christianity to new converts. Mission in, missions involve sending individuals and groups called missionaries across boundaries, most commonly geographical boundaries, to carry on evangelism or other activities such as educational or hospital work. It is a proactive effort to fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ. And in that statement, which I pinched off the Internet, I wanted to use for this morning. I want to draw your attention to this idea that mission crosses boundaries, because although historically mission has been about crossing geographical boundaries in our society and culture today, there are so many boundaries we need to cross for the gospel. There are so many boundaries that somehow we need to get over and reach out and share the love of Jesus. This week, for the first time ever in my classes in my 19 years as a teacher I had an experience and I'm sure I will have it again and I say it as a fact something that happened to me this week not as a point of judgment or discussion in that sense but a young person came to me after I called their name on the register and they said sir please don't call me that name anymore call me my new name because I've changed my gender that's never happened to me before I checked the notes on that young person's and I choose that word carefully on the school system. Uh, yes, this person had, with the permission and understanding of their parents, changed their gender. Now, I've got to be honest with you, that's outside of my comfort zone and outside of my experience. That's well outside. But that young person needs Christ as much as anyone. How do I, as her teacher, in the Church of England school, where I have a certain amount of freedom, share the love of Jesus with that young person. That's crossing boundaries. That's mission. It's not my place to sit there in judgment on her. She's not sitting there pretending to be a Christian and explaining how this fits in with her theology. She doesn't have any theology. But she is a young person who is created in the image of God. She is a young person who has value and worth in the eyes of God. And there is a boundary to cross in mission. Those boundaries, friends, will become increasingly relevant to us if the church is to continue to grow in a new generation. It is a massive challenge, but it is a definite challenge. It is one that requires our engagement, our prayerful reflection, and maybe new ways of reaching across boundaries. And what do we mean by a priority? I just want to say something about that very briefly because we've, we've worded this carefully as a leadership team. You'll notice that we make mission a priority. And that little word a is important. I'll explain why. Because a priority is something that is very important and must be dealt with before other things. So if we'd said mission was the priority, we would have said that it was the most important thing above all others. However, I can tell you, as my time as a Duke of Edinburgh Award leader, in my early days, when I was a bit more naive, it's all very well thinking I can lead some students on a difficult track, but if I haven't been there myself, we're going to get lost. So if mission was the priority, we'd say it takes 
all precedence over our worship, our prayer life, our personal development with Christ, our development as a church, that we become more like him, more Christ-like. So mission is a priority because we cannot lead people to places we have never been. It is a priority alongside our development, our growth as people in Christ. But if it's not a priority, then this church won't be here in 30 years' time. But if it's a priority, and if it is led with the grace of Christ, then we continue to see the gospel shared with a new generation. So just a, a very quick little video we're going to watch, which is a, uh, it, it's an interactive, not an interactive, really, it's, it's, it's just a quick video that shows how through mission the gospel has spread since the early church until now. And of course, it's geographical, but you can see how the gospel has broken through boundaries before and will break through boundaries again until Christ returns. Just a little reminder of geographically how the gospel spread through mission. Through as the purple on that map continued to spread, there were men and women that made sacrifices for the gospel. There were men and women that stood out of their comfort zone that asked, how is it that I communicate the love of Christ in this time across this boundary? How is it that I lift the name or we lift the name of Jesus on high? And that is a task that we continue to face today. Hence, we make mission a priority. I've started. Are we going to read from Acts? We're going to read the conversion of Paul. I'm just going to pick up a few principles about this. Uh, in in this passage. So if you want to follow with me on the screen, do. If you have your Bible and you want to follow that way, we're in Acts chapter 9, and I'm reading here from the NIV. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up. And go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The man travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how he much, how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as we were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. I've discovered something as my years go on. I'm becoming more like my grandfather. 
I know a couple of you here knew my grandfather. And I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, my, my grandfather was a scrap dealer. And uh, he used to have this great big sheepskin jacket. And I can always remember as a kid, granddad, but I would normally have four or five grand in oily tenors. You know, I don't have that in here. I just think, you know, in his jacket, in case there was a deal going down, in case there was something to buy uh, and so on. And, and some of you will know that I, I run a small and I stress small little business where uh, I sort of supply computers and phones and repair things and this like that. And I found out like my granddad, I'm pretty good at it. And uh, I, I went the other day. And then I got scrap dealer. My nan thinks it's the same sort of jeans that kick in. So I had to go the other day to the EE store because my phone had gone wrong and it's still under warranty. So I thought, well, I'll take it back to EE and let them deal with it. So I sat there in the EE store talking to the lady and she asked me if I needed a spare phone. And I said, no. And I said, I've got plenty of phones kicking around. She looked at me a bit quizzically and asked why. And I told her a little bit about my business. So anyway, long story short, I sold her a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, it's absolutely true. There's nothing about that story I've made up at all. You know, I just seem, I just seem to have the gift for it. I seem to be able to do it. And uh, thinking about phones, um, there was a few years ago, there was an iPhone that came out, the iPhone 4, and it, the slogan for it was this, this changes everything again. <laughs> This changes everything again because the previous iPhone had changed everything apparently and now everything was was changed again. Now, I don't know if you ever had an iPhone 4. I don't know if it actually changed everything for you, if it rocked your world. I've got to confess that actually a lot of what's happened in society has been changed through the development of technology. But actually now if you have an iPhone 4, you probably chuck it in the bin because there's just you – know, someone asked me to mend one the other day and I politely declined. So there's just no point. You know, there's just no value to it anymore. We've we've moved on. But for Paul, this changed everything. This genuinely changed everything. Until his dying breath on this earth, it changed his priorities. It changed what he did with his time. It changed what he did with his focus. Every hour, I'm sure, of his waking life was consumed with how he could be effective for the gospel of Christ. Previously to meeting the risen Jesus, he spent his time breathing out murderous threats against followers of the way, against the Christians. And then when he met the risen Jesus, when he realized the reality of the risen Christ and what that meant, and he has started to unpack this within his complete Jewish theology that he had, he realized that this genuinely changed everything. And I want to pick out briefly three principles from this text, three principles in making mission a priority. This changes everything for Paul. It changed Paul's direction. Now, I'm actually sort of playing with this a little bit. You'll see what I mean. I'll be honest about it. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you must be told what to do. Now, I'm sort of playing with this because actually you might say, well, hang on. Paul was on his way to Damascus anyway. But he was. Jesus sent him on his journey. Actually, from that point, immediately, Paul is sent in the same direction that he was heading. But the purpose and the reason that he's now going to Damascus has completely changed. When we make mission a priority in our life, when we wake up and we say to the Lord, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, how may I be of use to you today? How saviour can I be of value to you in your kingdom today? It doesn't mean that you no longer go to Williams to get your shopping. It doesn't mean that you no longer do the school run. You must do the school run, okay, if you have a school run, that's really important. It doesn't mean that you necessarily begin to change radically where you go, but the reason for which you go changes. It changes everything because you are an ambassador of Christ. You take that light that shines into the darkness. You take the love of Jesus to those places you go. And actually, after the time of Damascus, where Paul did go, did radically change. Paul's life from there on, geographically speaking, was incredibly different. Because he pressed on to spread the gospel into new places to the Gentiles. He ended up going back to Jerusalem, but not to Jerusalem in the same way as before. He went back to Jerusalem to be uh, in incredibly different circumstances because everything was changed. He pressed on to Rome to spread the gospel there. Everything had completely changed. The gospel changed Paul's direction completely. And then in Acts 13, we read this. 
In Acts 13, for the first time, we don't get it in Acts 9, or Acts 10, or Acts 11, or Acts 12, but you get it in 13. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, this new name is adopted. Jesus did give some of his followers new names there and then on the spot. He didn't do that with Saul. Jesus, when he revealed himself to Saul, didn't say there in Acts chapter 9, you're from now on going to be called Paul. Paul starts to use that name of himself. Other people start to use that name of himself. Why? Why the change of name? Well, Paul was the Roman version of the name Saul. Saul was the Hebrew name, and obviously it's got a a real pedigree and a mixed pedigree in many ways, the name Saul. And Paul was the Roman version. And what did Jesus said to Saul? You are going to take my, my message to the Gentiles. You're going to leave the Jewish world. You're going to go out there. You're going to cross the boundaries with mission. And it's almost certain that Saul begins to use the name Paul because it just has the currency out there and where he's going. He's going to the Gentile world. He has a Gentile version of his name. He uses the Gentile version of his name and it reflects the fundamental change in his priorities. His priority now is to reach out to the Gentiles with the gospel. And even his very name he uses reflects the fact that he is now going to a group of people to share with them the love of Jesus. But more than that, it changes his complete worldview. Later on, many years later, even in prison, Paul writes, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What a worldview. What a change for this man. What a completely different perspective on life and everything in it. This has changed Everything for this man, everything has changed. Later on, Paul would write these words to Timothy. Timothy on the island of Crete, he's been given that job of looking after that church. And Timothy's clearly a a young man. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech and conduct Love and faith and impurity. I've got a new radio in the car. Well, it's a newish car, and and uh, it's got one of those DAB radios in it. Not one of those DAB radios, you know. No, well, it gets Radio Four, which I'm happy with. You know, that's great. And occasionally, when the kids come in the car, they put on this thing called Heart. You ever heard Heart? It's just a noise. It's just a racket, you know. I'm 37 and I've got to that point. I'm like, there's no, there's no melody here. So I found on my DA, I'm sorry, Edward, but you know, you know how I feel about it. Okay. We have animated conversations about what is this noise in the car. And, and I found this radio on D- stereo station on DAB called Absolute 90s. Brilliant. I mean, it's all of my youth. With respect, it's probably not all of your youth. But there is a radio station called Absolute 70s and Absolute 60s. Uh, I, I, I'm really sorry, Steve, there isn't Absolute 50s, but, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I started to tune into this radio station and I'm listening to songs of tunes by bands that I grew up with, like Oasis and Blur and Suede. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, then a fact sheet will be available after <laughs> the service. I was listening to the other day, and I just got to the end of the song that I was enjoying, sort of driving on to Cheddar, listening to. And then at the end of the song, this little sort of snippet came on, and it said, if you remember these songs, then you are old. Oh, easy. What do you mean if I'm old? I'm only 37. You know, and I know that most of you can't see up there to see my bowl patch, but, you know, it is coming. And if I bend down, then then you'll see it. But that quote, that scripture, Paul said to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. He said it because Timothy was young, didn't he? Wouldn't make sense if Timothy wasn't young. But if Paul came and spoke to you about your priority of mission, he may say, do not let anyone look down on you because you're older. Do not let anyone look down on you because you're sick. Do not let anyone look down on you because you left school when you were 14 or didn't go to university. 
Do not let anyone look down on you because you haven't been to Bible college. Do not let anyone look down on you because you're a woman. Do not let anyone look down on you because you're not married. Do not let anyone look down on you because you've got a busy professional life. In all things, no matter who you are for all of us, mission is a priority. And we are all called to be involved in it, no matter what state in life we are in. And this is how much of a priority it is. From the BBC News website in February 2014. Widespread ignorance exists among children and parents about the contents of the Bible. Research has suggested surveys for the Bible Society. Okay, so it's a BBC website, but there's a source we can trust. Agreed? Surveys for the Bible Society found that almost three in ten young people were unaware that the story of the birth of Jesus came from the Bible. 30%. A similar number of children have never read or heard about tales of the crucifixion or Adam and Eve. I take issue of the word tales in there, but we'll leave that for now. The report was based on a poll of 800 children aged 8 to 15 and about 1,100 parents. Next slide, please, Edward. The study revealed a generation of children with little knowledge of the most important stories forming the basis of Christianity, and parents often knew little more. One of the children who were questioned more than, uh, one of the children who were questioned, uh, sorry, of the children who were questioned, more than a third failed to identify either the Good Samaritan or David and Goliath as biblical stories. Many of the parents who responded saw the Bible as a source of good values for their children. There's some hope there. But almost half did not recognize the story of Noah's Ark as coming from the Bible, and many confused biblical stories with priorities from well, sorry, plot lines from well-known films such as Harry Potter. The Bible Society commissioned the study as part of the Pass On campaign to encourage parents to give stories to their children. The group said the findings were symptomatic of the fact that many children indicate they have never read it's read it for yourself. Isn't our heart breaking? If it doesn't break your heart, friends, then go home and ask God to break your heart for it. You know, it's not that these kids And these parents are rebelling against God and the word. They don't know. They don't know. No one's told them. They've never read it. And yet we do. So why is it at the top of the list? Why are we making mission a priority? Because mission is a priority. It's got to be a priority. And you may think, but it's all very well saying it doesn't matter if I'm old or young or sick or well or busy or not busy. I'm sorry, Edward, the the Lord tells us through Paul that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. If you don't feel worthy, if you don't feel good enough, if you don't feel humanly equipped, you're in the right place. Because it's time to ask the Lord to give you a passion and a fever for sharing the love of God radically. I used to love watching the Two Fat Ladies cookery program. You remember that? I tried to find the clip on YouTube. I can't remember it, but there was, I couldn't find it. But there was this wonderful episode where they were making these sandwiches and uh, Jennifer Patterson was putting butter on the bread. Or she had, she was putting bread on the butter, I'm not sure. And she spread that with a zeal. And she didn't spread it. It was like mountain peaks of anchor butter all over this piece of bread. It looked like heart attack on a plate. Oh, it looked wonderful. <laughs> and that's how we are to spread the love of God. Liberally. Doesn't matter if it's too much. You can't have too much of it. I'm talking about the butter. No, I'm talking about the love of God. You can't have too much of it. You can't spread it too liberally. You can't say it enough. Now, I appreciate you may say, look, if we go on about it all the time, then people are going to get annoyed and so on. Well, yeah, okay, you'd be sensitive. But you have the discernment of the Spirit to do that. But the trouble is that where we begin is we're English. Do you know that? 
I know some of you here aren't English, and praise God for you, because those of us who are English, you know, put on a tie and do up our top buttons, think, well, I, I won't, I won't mention Jesus yet. So it's a long game. Maybe in four years' time, tell them, tell them, for they do not know. And we have this treasure in jars of clay. This is just. This is just things that I came up with on the way in the car. I had to pull over and note them down. I'm not going to preach these. There's just, I think it's eight or nine, just points just to try and hammer this home. And we're going through these really quickly. Why do we make uh, mission a priority? Because Jesus told us to. Because Jesus told us to. Jesus did it himself. Do you remember the woman at the well? Do you remember the boundaries that had to be crossed there? That woman that had been married and divorced and married and divorced and was now living in sin. With, with her new partner. And you may think, well, today that's not to do. Well, maybe today it's not. But don't start with the sin. Start with the person. Reach across the boundary. Reach across the boundary of the love of Christ. Yes, when people come into the kingdom, we expect to see changes. That's important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that everything is permissible. Far from it. But we cannot start with getting people's lives in order and then offer them Christ. We reach across the boundary first with the love of God and the gospel and see the power of God change these people because it's a core biblical principle because in the very beginning of scripture when God said to the serpent I'm going to raise up one that's going to strike crush your head mission and evangelism spreading the love of God has always been there it runs right through like breaking through a stick of rock because we are co-workers with Christ we are co-workers with Christ. Paul is very clear on that, that we have this as a job to do. Because that's how we got into the kingdom, is it not? That's how we got into the kingdom. When I remember that great man, Percy Staple, standing up and telling me about the love of Jesus. That's how I came into the kingdom. Because someone told me, made it a priority, gave us some time to have kids in the church on a Sunday afternoon. It was a priority for him, and that's why I'm in the kingdom, because the world needs it. The world needs it more than ever, and particularly in a society that's increasingly fractured over one political issue, and people are falling out, and people stand outside parliament shouting and screaming and hollering at each other, and that's just one thing in our society. This world needs more than ever the unity and the love that comes through Christ. Because how else will they know if we do not make mission a priority? Who else is going to tell them? You know, Williams is busy becoming a co-op. It's not busy trying to push out the gospel of every packet of cornflakes. No one else will do it. And I don't mean to say, by the way, that the other churches in the town won't. Don't get me wrong. We work with them. And every person that knows the Lord, because it's the ultimate way to love our neighbour. It is the ultimate way to love our neighbour. You may recognise this man. He's lost a lot of weight in recent years. His name's Penn Juliet. He's half of the um, of the, the magician duo Penn and Teller. You may have seen them there. Incredibly talented men. This guy is an out and out atheist. He is an out and out atheist. But a few years ago, and he he uh, he speaks about this on a little video he put on YouTube, very rough and ready video. He filmed it on his phone, just filmed his thoughts and uploaded it to YouTube. A few years ago, uh, after one of his uh, shows, a young Christian person came up to him and gave him a Bible and shared the gospel with him. Now, this guy is a, is a hardened atheist. But he recorded a little vlog, video blog, about that event. And he talked in a way that would shame so many Christians. Because he said, look, at the end of the day, I don't believe this stuff, but I know that that person believes with all their heart that there is such a thing as a heaven and a hell. And this is what he concluded. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it? But just let those words sink in. Here's an atheist. He's saying, thanks to the Bible, I don't buy it, but I respect where you're coming from. Because I get the fact that if you believe with all your heart that there is a heaven and hell, there is judgment against a holy and an eternal God, which we know to be true. 
How much do you have to hate somebody to believe all of that, but to not tell them about it? That is a challenge, is it not? That is a challenge. When a man who stands completely opposed to the truth of the gospel can see, I get why you're doing this. And at times we stand behind our British persona and forget to tell the world. I told you that I was excited about this teaching series. I hope my passion hasn't spilled over into getting your back up. I find this a challenge myself, a huge challenge. Forever having to stop and reflect and pray, how do I cross this boundary? How do I share the gospel here? But can I leave you with this piece of advice? Don't make it target driven. That's to say, don't measure your success of making mission a priority by how many converts you see for the Lord. It's not that we don't want to see that. Just do it. Just share. Just tell. There you go. That was recorded back in September 2019 at St. Clair's Chapel in the pulpit. And uh, it is a bit sad when I hear myself preach like that. I haven't preached like that for the last eight weeks, but uh, there we go. I'm also conscious as well, because I keep a, a diary of anecdotes, that uh, I know I'll have used some of those anecdotes before at MCF, so uh, forgive me if you heard the same stories again. But it'd be good to pray together as we just reflect on um, on that teaching, and we apply it to our situation today, because although we live in a quite a different world at the moment for the time being, mission still remains a priority. So if you would with me, just take a moment just to be quiet and still before the Lord. And let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, we ask that you help us in these strange and unprecedented days continue with wisdom and discernment to understand what it means to make mission a priority in our lives. And Lord, we pray that something positive would come out of this experience of COVID-19. Lord, maybe the most positive thing, that it would be a precursor to revival as you shake up your church, you shake up this world, and you draw people back to ask the fundamental questions and find the answers in you, Lord. So for the person that's sitting in front of this screen now, I pray, Lord, that you equip them, empower and impassion them, Lord, with a fever to make mission a priority. And bless us all, we pray as we don't only worship together, but move out together to share the good news of Christ. God bless you all. I look forward to being with you in chapel again.